the early 2000s as Roger Federer was winning his first Grand Slam titles and FC Basel returned to the top of the Super League, the global economy boomed. In many countries, interest rates were at an historically low level. Credit was very cheap. This persuaded many people and businesses to borrow, be it to buy a house, to start or expand a business, or to invest on the financial markets. Banks and other financial firms responded by offering new financial products at very competitive prices. In some cases, they sought to spread the risks of these products more broadly. For instance, by bundling up riskier assets such as mortgages with safer ones to create new financial products. Rating agencies gave these new financial products good ratings, as the underlying risks seemed low and they sold extremely well. But then, things turned sour. By 2007, market participants began to doubt the safety of many of these products. As they tried to get rid of them, prices plummeted, causing problems for the many financial firms and investment funds that held huge quantities in their portfolios. Some banks took severe losses and had to be rescued. Markets froze. On the 15th of September 2008, the investment bank Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy triggering a global loss of confidence in the financial system. Unprecedented action by governments and central banks was required to prevent a global financial crisis that might well have been worse than that of the 1930s. How could it come to this? What triggers financial crises? Financial crises are like a fire. You need both tinder and a spark. And the more tinder you have, the smaller the spark needed in order to cause the fire. What's the tinder? All crises have one element in common, which is too much borrowing and lending, which creates too much debt and asset prices that are too high. What's the spark? Well, that's harder to tell because it could be almost anything. It could be a bank which is incurring losses which are unexpected. It could be a change in investor sentiment towards a country, or it could be a change in government that causes some instability. What is really important is that it is exceedingly hard to predict crisis because you cannot really tell when the spark will set the fire. You can measure the vulnerability that is the tinder, but not the spark itself. What can be done once a crisis has broken out? So once the crisis breaks, the first thing authorities really need to do is to re-establish trust in the system and ensure that money flows freely. And that actually means that they need to intervene directly. For instance, they may inject money into the economy so that borrowers can find the necessary funds. They may also close down banks whilst ensuring that customer deposits are safe. Last, they will actually typically do broad-based macro policies, such as lowering interest rates, which makes money cheaper and thus debt easier to refinance. What role does international cooperation play in dealing with financial crises? Take, for example, the question of how to strengthen our banks so they're better prepared for future financial crisis. This can be done through banking supervision and regulation. For example, we can ask banks to set aside a greater portion of their capital in the form of a reserve or a buffer that can be used in times of crisis. Banking regulation is usually set at the national level but banks operate internationally and some even operate globally. If every jurisdiction was to implement their own rules, this would create an unlevel playing field and would not contribute to global financial stability. So what we need is a globally agreed set of minimum standards and rules that each jurisdiction can implement nationally. The BIS provides an important form of cooperation for bank regulators to gather from around the world, agree to these standards and then implement them nationally. We live in a time where the global economy and the financial system are highly interconnected. That means that to prevent financial crises, we need global solutions. 